Good evening, everyone. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us again here on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday. I pray that you have had a blessed day. I know my family and I certainly are blessed to have you join with us in our worship here tonight. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Facebook. One of the beautiful things about Facebook is as we do this live, we have the opportunity to interact with you uh, throughout the service. Uh, tonight, my wife, Latanya, will be serving as the chat host. So if you would, if you're listening, watching, if you will just uh, drop a note of hello, let us know that you're there. We certainly would appreciate that. We also ask if you have prayer requests, if you will go ahead and put those in the comments. Uh, we will uh, notice those uh, during the service, but also we like to, after the service, come back, we read through them as a family, and we pray for them as a family. So please do that. Thank you so much. Um, we are grateful to be able to share in worship and the word tonight. Um, before we go to the Lord in prayer and go to the word to look for guidance and instruction, we're going to worship together tonight. I'm going to ask Brianna, if she would, to come around. She's going to join me in singing. I should say I'm joining her in singing because she has a beautiful voice, and I just try not to uh, try not to mess her up. We're going to sing this song um, that I heard a number of years ago, and I think I heard it early in my Christian walk, and it was a song that really blessed me a lot. It's a song by Fred Hammond. And, um, and he talks about all the things that Jesus is to us. Um, and, and as maybe you've heard this before, if you know the words, please sing along with us. Uh, those of you who have given me your email address, I sent you the words out just a little earlier today, this afternoon. So please sing along right where you are. Let's worship together. But even if you don't know it, just listen to these words. Listen to all of the things that Jesus is to us. He is, Jesus is, the living word. We first say he is the bread of life. Amen. Bread of life. Just think about that. He's broken for us. Jesus is the living word. Bread of life sent down from glory. Many things you were on earth, a holy king, a carpenter. You are the living word. Bread of heaven sent down from glory. Many things you were on earth, a holy king, a carpenter. You are the living word, bread of heaven, bread of heaven, sent down from glory. Many things you were on earth, a holy king. A carpenter, you are the living word. Awesome ruler, gentle redeemer. God with us, the living truth. And what a friend we have in you. You are the living word, awesome ruler, gentle redeemer, God with us, the living truth, and what a friend we have in you, you are the living word, say his name, Jesus, Jesus. That's what we call you. Manger born, but on a tree. You died to save humanity. You 
are the living word. Oh, 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 Jesus, Jesus, that's what we call you. Manger born, but on a tree, you died to save humanity. You are the living word. Oh, oh. Listen to the word of God. The Bible tells us in John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with the word and all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. In verse 10, it says he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And then later in verse 14, it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Lord, we praise you because you are not dead, for you are the living word. And we thank you in Jesus' name. We praise you for being our living word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together, if we could. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessing of our gathering tonight. Lord, certainly we would have it that we all could be under one roof in a place that is consecrated for you. But Father, no matter where we are and how we gather, because we are together in your name, you are in our midst. We thank you for your presence, Lord, especially in the difficult times that we face right now. Lord, I lift up all of those that are a part of our service tonight. I lift up to you, especially those, Lord, who put a prayer request there in the comments, Lord. You know all about every situation. I pray, Lord, that you will move mightily in the lives of people who are desperate to see your power, desperate to feel your love, desperate to, to be under the warm embrace of your comfort, Lord. Touch us, Lord, in only the way that you know how. Father, I pray that you will bless and keep our family. I pray, Lord, that you bless all of our friends, our, our church family members, Lord. I pray that you help us, Lord, to get through this difficult thing that we face. But Father, we know that we are not in this without you, for you are the living word through Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brianna.
<clears throat> we love that song and thank you all for uh, worshiping with us <clears throat> in that song. I'm going to ask if you would go ahead and find your place in Revelation chapter 12 is where I will be tonight. I uh, thank the Lord for his word. I thank the Lord for the opportunity for me to share his word with you, even here through this technology of Facebook. Uh, some of you I know, some of you maybe I have never met, but I pray that we are all believers in Christ and one day we'll get to rejoice together in heaven. Amen. Mm -hmm. But tonight we're going to go together to the Lord um, through his word. He is the living word, as we just sang. And we're going to go to Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to be reading from the King James Version. And I pray that you'll read along with me wherever you are. Whatever means that you have, whether you have a physical Bible or you're using a device, your phone, whatever, it's the Word of God, and we thank God for it. So I'm going to read Revelation 12, verses 1 through 11. And the King James Version reads like this. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up into God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Last verse. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. I pray that the Lord will add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. I want to share with you just a few moments here tonight from the title of my message, The Power of Your Testimony. The Power of Your Testimony. Let's pray together again if we could. Father, I humbly approach your throne of grace, Lord, asking access through your son, Jesus. Take us to the place, Lord, where your word becomes clear in our hearts and minds, Lord. Open our hearts, Lord, to receive it, Father, that we be not just hearers of your word, but doers of your word. Father, remind us tonight of the power of our testimony, the power of our acknowledgement of you active in our lives. Father, we need you now more than ever. The enemy is great, but you are greater, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I don't know how much time, perhaps, you have spent in the book of Revelation, but... Um, even if you haven't spent much, even just hearing or reading with me there in Revelation chapter 12, you can see why this book has for some the reputation of being a scary book. 
I know when I was a child, I used to hear about the book of Revelation, about end time and dragons and the devil and all of these things. And, and, and honestly, I was a little afraid to read it. And later I read it and, and it can be troubling. But as I've grown not just older in age, but also hopefully wiser in the Lord, I've come to better appreciate what this book is all about. And certainly the book of Revelation is so deep and is so wide, like a great river, that we certainly would not be able to cross it in, uh, fully tonight uh, in our time together. But I do want to bring out some things, if I could, here that I hope will be helpful from Revelation chapter 12. But before we dive back into this book, there are just three things I want to share with you um, about studying in the book of Revelation. Three things that I learned from just years of going back to it and asking the Lord to help me to better understand it that is helpful to me now to have it sort of straightened out in my mind, or at least to have these tips and tools, if you will, that's helpful to me when I read Revelation. And I want to share it with you quickly. Um, so that I, I pray it will be helpful to you in some way, not just tonight for tonight's sermon, certainly for that, but just at any point that you decide or you're going to read in, in this great book. So really, these are three quick tips I want to give you just some understanding that you can have as you read the book of Re Revelation. First of all, you need to understand <clears throat> it's not all literal. It's not all literal. Certainly, as I know you've read the word throughout scripture, you will see that the Lord oftentimes likes to, he likes to paint pictures for us. He uses uh, situations to paint a picture of maybe future things. He uses symbols to paint a picture for us. Even Jesus, when he walked here on earth, he taught often in parables. And these stories would paint a picture of spiritual things for us to understand. And certainly the book of Revelation is no different. Now, I believe that there are some things that are said in the book of Revelation that we are to take it literally. But there are a lot of things in the book of Revelation that is not meant to be taken literally. Um, it, so it's not all literal. So don't, don't allow yourself to get too tangled up when you read things like as we're reading tonight about a red dragon. I don't know, I don't believe that we're going to actually see a red dragon. So it's not all literal. So that's the first thing you need to know in the book of Revelation, it's not all literal. The second thing is this, it is not all chronological. It's not all chronological. That was the thing that used to really, really get me confused in reading the book of Revelation because I would read through it, and I'm used to reading a story that follows a time pattern, a chronological order. You know, pretty much as you begin to read the Bible from Genesis 4, most of it as it goes along is somewhat chronological. Um, and so you kind of follow that. If you were to read the book of Matthew, it kind of follows the life of Christ chronologically here on earth. So we get used to that. But you need to understand that not all in Revelation is chronological. In fact, I think as we read it, we begin to see that as the Lord, you know, you need to understand that God is above time. God is not constrained by time and place as we are. God has no beginning and no end, so we cannot fit him in a box of time as we are in. We have a beginning and an end. We, so, but he is above time. He is, he is eternal. And so the Lord at one point can be looking down upon us and he can be talking about something that's now, something that has passed, something that is yet to come all at the same time. And I used to read the book of Revelation and get so confused. I'm like, okay, that sounds like something that I read about in the Old Testament. Oh, wait, now it's talking about something I believe is going to come in future times. But wait, was it actually happening at the time he gave this revelation to the Apostle John? And so it can get a little confusing. So just understand that it's not all chronological and that's okay but you need to understand that the third and final thing is this not only is it not all literal and not only is it not all chronological the third thing it's not all understandable i, I want to let you off the hook i want to give you a break 
If you're earnestly trying to read and understand the book of Revelation, please just know it's not all understandable. You won't understand it all. I won't understand it all. Even the smartest, most studied biblical scholar, there's no way in the world that he could stand flat footed and say that he or she understands all of the book of Revelation because we just don't know. The Lord is speaking uh, again, not literally all the time, not chronologically. He speaks of things and symbols and all of this. So there is no way that we can understand it all. We can understand a lot of it, but we can't understand it all. So that's okay. Don't feel the pressure of feeling it like you've got to understand it all. And certainly even here in Revelation chapter 12, I could spend two hours going through just this chapter and I won't understand it all. And I don't think you can understand it all. We won't understand it all. There's so much packed in there. But I believe we can dig in here and we can pull some things out that will help us. So that's just uh, three quick things I wanted to give you about studying the book of Revelation. It's not all literal. It's not all chronological. And it's not all understandable. But what I believe we can understand, I want to share with you uh, tonight from here in chapter 12 is something that's important. So let me make sure that I understand that you see the scene and the characters, the people and the figures um, that the Lord is using here in this vision given to the Apostle John and so that we can pull something out of it. So first, you will have noticed as I read there at the beginning of chapter 12, it tells us about a woman who is clothed with the sun. So this is a vision that the Lord has given John and he sees in this vision a woman says she is clothed with the sun. Again, I just said I believe that a lot in, in the book of Revelation is not meant to be literal, but this is figurative. It is something that is to paint a picture of something else. Now, some people believe that this woman that's referred here to referred to here in chapter 12 is Mary, that is talking about Mary, the mother of, of Jesus. In fact, a lot of people hold to that, and a lot of people in the Catholic Church hold to, to that. Um, but other people believe that it is a, a, a different uh, picture that the Lord is painting when he's using this, this, um, this vision of a woman clothed in the sun. And many po people believe that this is referring to God's people or the church, that this woman clothed with the sun is, is God's people, first with the chosen people, the children of Israel, and now to us who believe that we as the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, that we are this woman that is clothed with the sun. It says that this woman um, delivered a man-child and that this man-child was caught up to God to his throne. And we know, of course, that is representative of Jesus. So we're talking about God's chosen people and now Jesus. And certainly we, we can see that Jesus was born out of the children of Israel. He was of the of uh, a descendant of David. Of, uh, and, and so he he's born of that woman of God's chosen people of the church. And and now here's this child is referring to Jesus. But then it, it also goes on in, in the story and the and the, uh, the the pictures that the Lord is painting here in His vision. That vision they get a little bit darker, and it tells us of a red dragon. It says that this red dragon drew a third of the stars from his from the sky with his tail. Now we don't have to guess what the red dragon represents because the scripture tell us here, right here in in chapter twelve that this red dragon represents Satan, the devil himself. And so it says that this dragon or Satan tries to kill the child, the man child, Jesus. And, and certainly uh, Satan took many attempts at the, the life of Jesus, but in particular, he was intending to kill Jesus on the cross of Calvary. But we know that the Lord had a different plan for the death of Christ on, on the cross. But it also tells us here that I just read about a great spiritual war between Michael, which is God's archangel, or God's chief angel, and his armies versus this great dragon or Satan and his angels. And his angels we often refer to as demons. And so when Satan was cast out of heaven, 
He brought with him a third of the angels that became his followers, um, that we refer to them as, as, as demons. And this great battle, and, and Satan is, is kicked out of heaven to earth, where he has been causing havoc ever since. And we face this dragon. We face this dragon every day that we live. Now, again, it's not literal. It's not like one day you're going to walk out of your house and there will literally be a red dragon sitting out in your driveway waiting for you. Now, maybe it would make it easier if he did show up as a red dragon because right now he is so cunning. He is just so deceptive that oftentimes he works through things and people and we don't know it's him. So perhaps if he was a red dragon, maybe we could at least identify him better. Maybe at least if he would show up like they depict him in the movies and on cartoons, at least if he'd wear all red and have a red pointy tail with horns, right? at least we could pick him out of a crowd. But this dragon is a spiritual dragon. This, this Satan that we come against, we face him every single day. But the good news is, is that the battle has already been decided. Remember, I told you that God is eternal and where he sits, he is above all time and place. And so when Jesus hung his head on the cross and said, it is finished, it didn't mean that it was over and he took us all up to heaven. Then he said the battle, the future battle against us that we face every day is already won. It's finished. And you need to remind yourself of that every day when you face this battle as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, it is already finished. But we've still got a fight to fight. So for now, we we still fight. And, and the dragon has has weapons that he uses that it is told to us here in in revelation 12 and the weapons that he uses are lies and deceit and accusation the bible says here in revelation 12 that he he accuses the brethren the brothers and sisters us believers in christ before god day and night every single day he is accusing us telling lies on us planting, trying to plant seeds of doubt in God's mind about us. He's the great accuser. He is the great liar. He is the father of lies. He's the deceiver. Here in Revelation 12, it says he's deceiving the whole world. And those are his weapons. But we have weapons too. The Bible talks about many, but here in Revelation, it talks about two in particular. And I want to read Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 for you again, if you'll look at that. It says, and they overcame him, <clears throat> excuse me, that is Satan, the great dragon. They overcame him by two things, the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. The blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So first, the blood of the Lamb. Without Christ dying on the cross for our sins, we would not be able to defeat Satan. In fact, there would be absolutely no hope for us because Satan would not be the greatest enemy that we should worry about. God would be the greatest enemy that we should worry about because we are sinners and we have violated the laws of God. God would, is our adversary without Christ. But he shed his blood, the, the precious lamb of God, who's taken away the sins of the entire world. Here, John says that it is by the blood of the lamb that we overcome our great enemy. So I'm going to tell you, it does not matter anything that I have said before now or after now, if you have not already received Christ as your savior. I can teach you the Bible from beginning to end and you understand every doctrine perfectly. You memorize all the main verses. You, you, you know them from front to back. It would not matter one bit if you are not a born again believer. If Christ is not your king, then you are not safe. But he says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb. Praise God for the lamb that was slain. Thank God for thinking enough of us that he said, I cannot overlook their sin, but I will send them a savior. He will come as the lamb of God. 
So we overcome by the blood of the lamb. But it says the second weapon that we have is, he says, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. I want us to think about, and this is really, I'm finally getting to really the point of my message tonight, and that is our testimony, your your testimony, the power of your testimony. You know, sometimes we think of that word testimony and and we sort of narrow it down to meaning just telling the story of when you got saved and how Christ saved you, where you were and how it happened, what it felt like and all of those things. And, and certainly that is wonderful to share. It is critical to share. It is, it is absolutely a testimony of God. But we should not limit our testimony, the word of our testimony to just that one day. In fact, every day that we live, there is a testimony that we have for God. So we need to understand that testimony is not just telling people the story about how you got saved. Testimony means to tell of of anything that God has done or is doing in your life in any given time. That word testimony is probably uh, better described by saying it means to bear witness. That means we are to bear witness. We are to to bring attention to God and what he's done for us in any situation, not just the day that we got saved. So we can, I believe, we can bear witness of God in everyday things in our lives. Y'all have heard me say, some of you, you've heard me say on these videos is, it's become not really a catchphrase, just a hashtag, but it is a, a principle for my ministry that is driving us. And you, you hear me say, you'll see it posted on Facebook or my Instagram or whatever it is, seeing God every day. In fact, that's the name of my blog site, seeing God every day. Or you might see me post hashtag, I see God every day. And the point of all of this is I want all of us, I want us to be able to, to know that we can see God every day, even in the, the littlest of things, if we're looking for him. And if we see God every day, we can bear witness to God every single day, even in the littlest of things. And when we do that, not only do we glorify God, but we are also pushing back the enemy. The enemy is great. He's busy today. He's not going to roll over and play dead. He's going to come stronger and stronger every day. That's why you need to realize the power of your testimony. John said to us here in the book of Revelation that we overcome him, the great dragon, Satan, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. And so I want you to be able to see that God is active in your life every day and you can speak of that. You can tell people about that. You can bring attention to it. You can post about it. You can sing about it. You can write a poem about it. You can tell people at work about it, whatever you need to do, but you need to bear witness of the things that God is doing in your life every single day. So with that, and to help you see that, I want to share with you uh, quickly three things that are a part of my testimony. I've got so many. I've got so many that I could share. Um, but I, I just want to share these things, <clears throat> that th- th- three things or three situations that come to mind that, that I want to bear witness of the goodness of God. The first thing is this. So this was, this took place, um, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, and we were going on vacation, and, you know, we were, you know, Tanya and I were trying to, you know, pull together a nice vacation, as nice as we could afford for our family at the time, to be able to go somewhere and just spend a little time together, and at that time, we had a car. It was a good car, but we had had it a long time, and and it had well over 100,000 miles on it, <clears throat> but it was the best car we had at the time, 
And that's what we're going to take on vacation. So I got out there, I washed it, cleaned it up and vacuumed it out and and changed the oil and all of those things, trying to make sure that this car would be ready for this long trip. And um, and so um, the Lord blessed us. Um, my nephew, um, who has a, a, a beach house um, uh, up in... Um, up in Delaware, uh, Ocean City, I couldn't think of it, thank you, um, uh, let us go there for a few days. God bless you if you happen to watch this. Thank you so much, Dino, for that. And we went, and on the way back, we we're going to stop at King's Dominion. So if anybody on the on the East Coast here, you know about King's Dominion, this amusement park. And so um, before we left and got the car gassed up and everything, I decided, I said, well, maybe I should put... Um, put a, a jug of coolant in the trunk of the car just in case you know the car happens to run high and then as I got ready to turn and, and step out of the, the garage building there where we were staying at the time I saw a roll of duct tape laying on the counter and so I just said hey you can always use some duct tape so I grabbed it and threw it in the trunk we went off on vacation we went to Ocean City we um, had a good time. We were on our way back down south on 95. We were going to King's Dominion to the amusement park. And just before we got to the turnoff, I looked down and my engine was running hot. I said, oh my Lord, please, please don't let this car run hot. Don't let it break down. I got my family out here on the road. The girls were much younger then and you know, just didn't want our vacation to be ruined by that. I was like, please Lord, at least let me make it off the exit you know, into the park. And we did, he allowed us to get in the park and we, you know, got in, we parked the car and I'm sitting here thinking, what am I going to do all the way out here? Don't really know anybody. I pray it's nothing bad. I pray the engine is not messed up. And I look and of course the coolant had gotten low and, uh, and I was trying to figure out how was it losing coolant. And I realized that there was a hose that had a, a pinhole in it that was spinning uh, coolant out, and that's where it was losing coolant. And guess what? I had in the trunk everything that I needed to fix it. I wiped that hose off. I wrapped it in duct tape. I took that jug of coolant and filled it back up, and all was good. We went and had a great time, made it home safely. And it was, at the time, I thought, I said, you know, something just told me to get that coolant and that duct tape. I realized now it was not just something, it was somebody, it was God. And I praise God for that. I praise God for having the whole universe to think about, and yet he was concerned about our safety on our vacation. Enough to plant that seed of thought in my mind, that notion in my mind, to grab that coolant and to grab that duct tape. That is the power of your testimony. Second thing, quick, I want <clears throat> to share him with you. Um, some of you might know that I used to be a high school social studies teacher. It's been many moons ago that I taught high school, but I actually went to college to be a high school teacher and taught social studies for uh, four years. And, and I just realized I didn't feel like I was going to be able to, I wanted to make a career out of it. I didn't, <clears throat> honestly, I didn't think I could survive it for 30 years. And was trying to think of what else am I going to do with a degree in history, and um, I didn't know what I was going to do. An opportunity came up for me to sell insurance. In fact, it was the company that we had just purchased some life insurance with, and they had a gentleman who was retiring, and he came and talked to me and said, hey, maybe you'd like to be an insurance agent. And I said, okay, I never sold anything but maybe some donuts on a fundraiser or something like that, but I said, sure. And, um, you know, it was, they kind of told me about how much money you can make and all the opportunities and that kind of, you know, glossed my eyes over a little bit. And it, and it worked out that they started you off on a salary and commission. But over a period of time, the salary would start to taper off and they expected you to make up the difference with the commission. Well, needless to say, I'm not a salesperson. I just was not good at it. I did not enjoy it. And uh, as the months rolled on and that commission started to taper off, the income just was not coming in that we needed to really to be able to survive. And then I started, I was down on myself because I'm like, wow, I made this decision and it's affecting my family. 
and I just don't know what I'm going to do. And so one morning I had a few appointments scheduled with some clients to try to sell them some insurance. And I rode out with, you know, all hope in mind that I was going to make a sale that day and spent about a half a day and didn't sell a thing. Came back home. We were living in Rocky Mountain at the time and <clears throat> came back home, pulled up in the driveway, was feeling very down and um, just defeated. And I sat there in my car and I thought, Lord, I, I, I feel like I've made a bad decision and now this is affecting my family and I don't want it to affect my family. You know, our, our girls were young at the time, a little, and I don't even know if Brianna was born yet at the time and Ariel was, was probably a toddler. And, um, and I just prayed. I sat there in the car and I prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, if there's any way that you could help us, please, Lord, help us. So I ended my prayer. I got out of my car. And I looked down to the mailbox and I thought, oh, yeah, I need to check the mail. But I figured it's probably just more bills. But I said, well, I got to get the mail out anyway. So I walked down to the end of my driveway and I opened up and it was a you know stack of envelopes. And I'm walking back towards the house and I'm shuffling through my mail, bill, bill, bill. And then I look and there was an envelope from the school system that I had last worked. And I didn't know why I was getting this envelope from the school where I had last worked. But it looked like a check. <laughs> and I said, this must be something wrong. They paid me out all my vacation, all of that. Went inside. Long story short, at the time they were doing this new ABCs of accountability. And if the school reached certain targets that not only the teachers that taught those classes that were state tested, but the whole school, all of the teachers would get a bonus. And our school got a bonus that year. And I hadn't even finished teaching the whole year. And I got a check for like $1,200. And it was such a blessing. And it was so on target, so on time. That is no way in the world it could not have been God. And that so encouraged me. And that was just God reminding me that he will let, never leave me nor forsake me. And I want to share that with you to know that he will never leave you nor forsake you. That he will never let you beg for bread, as the scriptures say. And that is the word of my testimony. The final, the third and final testimony I want to share is when I got saved. Real quick. You know, it's been now uh, almost 23 years ago. Ariel, our oldest daughter, was a baby. And, um, you know, we had been away from church. We'd gone to college and graduated, come back, and we really weren't that into church. And and uh, But I felt like we wanted to raise our children in church, so Tanya and I started going back to church and taking Ariel as a baby. And then Sunday after Sunday, I felt like that the Lord was just pulling on me, touching me in some way, and drawing me, and, 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 and I felt like He was speaking to me, but... I didn't want to go up when the preacher gave the, the, the altar call. So that Saturday night, we were going to church that next morning, happened to be flipping through TV, and I landed on a channel where Reverend Billy Graham was preaching at a crusade, a, a stadium full of people. And just as I got there, he was giving the altar call. And there were thousands of people, and he was pointing up into the stands. He said, if you believe in Christ, I want you to come down. He said, don't worry about how long it takes. I want you to come down. And he said, and it's like he looked in the camera and it felt like he was looking right at me. And he said, he said that if Jesus died for you publicly, at least you can do, the least you can do is to acknowledge him publicly. And I felt like he was speaking right to me. And so the very next day we went back to church we were a little late getting there. We were sitting way in the back. The preacher was giving the invitation at the time. And I kept saying to myself, I don't want to go up. I don't want people to be speculating what's going on in my life. But I could not resist it any longer. I looked at Tanya. She was holding Ariel as a baby. And I said, I want to go up front. And she looked as surprised as I felt. And we went up to the altar and the preacher prayed with me. And he asked me, he said, is there anything that you want to say to me? And I said, I didn't know what to say except what I heard Reverend Billy Graham say. And I said to the preacher, his name is Reverend Timmy Chavis. If he happens to watch this, God bless you, Brother Chavis, for preaching those sermons, especially that sermon, and leading me to the Lord. But I told Brother Chavis, I said, well, Jesus died for me publicly, so the least that I could do is to acknowledge him publicly. And he prayed for me that Sunday morning. 
and my life has never ever been the same. That is a part of my testimony. And I want you to know that if you are saved, the day that you got saved is part of your testimony. It's your testimony. But it's so much more than that. It's everything that God does you does for you every single day. You are to bear witness of what God is doing in your life. And when you do that, not only are, are you glorifying God, but you are chasing away your enemy. And I want you to share your testimony, bear witness of the goodness of God in your life. Don't be afraid to do it. I know that we live in this society now that's um, so politically correct. And in a lot of ways, we live in a world that is against the things of God. And you can get yourself in so much trouble by talking about God in, in the wrong places. But I tell you, those wrong places are the exact right places to share your testimony. We're facing a great enemy that we cannot defeat on our own. I thank the Lord that he has already shed his blood on Calvary's cross and we overcome by the blood of, of the lamb, but we also overcome by the word of our testimony. My brothers, my sisters, share your testimony. Let's close in prayer if we could. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that there's so many things that you've done in my life that I could talk about you all day, every day. You are a good God. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our acclamation. You are worthy of us speaking highly of you every single day and every chance that we get. But Father, not only is it a way to glorify you, our testimony is also a way that we fight back our enemy. So Lord, whenever he speaks doubt, whenever he speaks fear, Whenever, Lord, he speaks lies and accuses us, Lord, I pray that we drive him back by the power of our testimony of the goodness of you in our life. Father, we thank you so much for what your son Jesus did for us that we could not do for ourselves. I thank you for your word tonight, Lord, and I pray that it has meant something to someone Lord, we stand upon your word, that rock that never moves. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for, again, joining my family and I tonight. It is an honor for us to be able to worship with you and to serve you in some way. We're going to continue to do this on Sunday evenings as the Lord continues to lead. There'll be some other things. We're going to be coming out soon. I'll be announcing those very soon, some things we're going to be doing on YouTube that I hope will be helpful in some way. But thank you so much for your time. God bless you. We love you and have a wonderful, wonderful night.